Good morning. Welcome to Eastside this morning. Join with us as we read Psalm 145, verses 1 through 7. I will exalt you, my God, the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation commends your works to another. They tell of your mighty acts. They speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty, and I will meditate on your wonderful works. They tell of the power of your awesome works, and I will proclaim your great deeds. They celebrate your abundant goodness and joyfully sing of your righteousness. Amen. Let's worship together.
Lord, we pray that you'll join us in service this morning, Lord. Each of us here and each of us through the internet, Lord. Just touch, heal, strengthen, be with each and every one, and show them your word today, Lord. For it's in my precious name we pray. Amen. 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 Welcome to Eastside. Uh, Eastside is a church called to bring lost people to Jesus. We share God's love with others, invite them to meet Christ, and to help them follow Christ and change the world. Connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or our webpage at esnavs.com. Join us this afternoon. ES kids at 1 o'clock through Zoom, teens at 3, adults at 5. If you don't have the links, contact Pastor Joe and they'll get them to you. We have daily devotionals on Facebook uh, or at ES Nas also. Um, Pastor Joe has a devotional love Monday through Friday. So just uh, join with him in what he has for the Lord to say to you that day. <clears throat> Please stand for the great readings. Matthew chapter 22, we're going to start off with. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. I am with you always to the very end of the age. Amen. And we're so glad that you're with us this morning. Of course, it's Mother's Day, and uh, all of us won't be eating out this afternoon, right? We, we do want to take a minute, not only with our Mother's Day gift package you got this weekend, but just to let you know, mothers are vital. And we're so thankful for you and, and for the ladies in our church who provide leadership. Um, just listen if you would. We love all our mothers. We love the young and the old, the rich and the poor, the white, the black, the brown, the smart, the helpful, the athletic, the friendly, the shy, the loud, the quiet, the optimist and the pessimist, the conservative and the liberal, those who have born children and those who have helped raise other children. You are all a symbol of God's love to us, and we are grateful. Let's continue our worship.
of everyone bowing down and throwing their crowns at your feet and singing holy, holy, holy. We recognize that's what we're supposed to do too. And we thank you for this opportunity to worship you with your people, even scattered. We ask God that you would hear our praise, that you would know our love, that you would feel our gratitude and our worship, that you would know that we know that you are the true God that you are the creator, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last, that you, Lord Jesus, have been the Son forever and will be the Son forever, and that you loved us enough to come down and become a person, that you loved us enough to put up with life on this earth, that you loved us enough to be betrayed and tortured and killed, and that you were raised from the dead to the glory of God. And that Holy Spirit, you have been working throughout eternity. But you have been given to us in these days that we might follow Christ. And that we might do your will. And that we might be your voice in this world. And we look forward to the day that all this illness and sickness is gone. That all our failures and faults are healed. That all the problems of this life are lost in your glorious presence. And we anticipate that with joy and excitement. And Lord God, we thank you that you give us a glimpse of that here. We pray, Lord, for those who are sick and hurting. We pray, Lord, for those who are missing loved ones who they can't see. We pray for those, Lord, who are dying and coming near death. We pray for those who provide care, especially in this Nurses Week. We thank you for all those who for centuries have provided your care and your love by nursing and other health professions that work with them, Lord. And we thank you, Lord, for their work, and we ask for your blessing on them. We pray, Lord, for our leaders in these hard days, both in the church and in the government, and in the business world, that you would give each person your wisdom about what to do and how to do it. And we pray, Lord, for our brothers and sisters, those Eastsiders around the nation, and Lord, for our brothers and sisters around the world, that you would prepare your church in this time to do things it never has before, that you would lead us to be your people in a way we never have before, that this would be the beginning of your kingdom having more impact than it has. We ask that you help us to be ready and to do what we should. And we thank you, Lord, for this time. We ask that you would continue to receive honor and glory from what happens this morning. Amen. I'd like to remind you to look at your bulletin and the prayer list that we have there. Um, and remember to lift each other up each day. And remember to pray for those who are on our special request list. Uh, thank you for your prayers and your love for each other.
of the gospel, John chapter 15, verses 1 through 8. I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. This is the gospel of our Lord. Thanks Thanks to to you, you, Lord Lord Jesus Jesus Christ. Christ. Thank you, most beautiful reader. Thanks for all the help from the worship team and our tech team. Thankful for your help, of course. I couldn't do this all by myself, and we're real grateful for that. We also need your help. We need you to help us by praying. We need you to help us by keeping in touch with each other. And we need you to help us by pushing like on your copy of this video and by sharing it with some people you know and care about. So thank you for your help with that. Well, here we go. We're talking about the Spirit of God again, and today we're talking about the Spirit of God and how God provides for us, okay? We've talked about comfort and how God provides God's favor through the Spirit and how God gives us strength through the Spirit, and today we're talking about provision. So join with me if you would. It's a simple question, do you have enough? Do you have all you need? Do you have all you want, or are you always wanting just a little bit more? 
Someone once asked Henry Ford how much money he needed, and he said, just a little bit more. I've got to admit that I'm going through a change in my life in these days. We're, we're getting to the place to where we're working with what we have and taking care of the things we need to. And we're so grateful for, for all that's happened in that. But contentment is a double-edged coin. If you're content when you don't have what you're supposed to have, then you're missing out. If you're not content where you have what you should have, then you're missing out. Um, in, in finances, you don't need to be trying to get more all the time, but you need to be living within what you have. In possessions, James Dobson says, every possession you have takes a little bit more maintenance. So the less you have, the less you have to maintain. You get that new car, you gotta make sure there's oil in it, you gotta make sure the tires have air in them, by the way, you shouldn't buy a new car, but that's just another issue. If you have a house, you're thankful for your house, but then you have to work on it and you have to take care of it. And somebody in your family is going to be trying to always do different things in it, not mentioning names or anything. And so we, we always have things to maintain if we have things. And so we're thankful for that. Relationships. If you're content with people who don't help you be more like Christ, then you're missing out. But if you have people who are good in your life and you're not caring for them, then you could lose those relationships. Achievement. I'm still praying football season comes, but, you know, Coach Saban at Alabama has won six titles. How many is enough for, for sports people, for business people, for a lot of us in the areas that we have giftings and abilities, we always want a little more because we want to continue to achieve. That's not a bad thing all the time. And how about faith? For some people going down to the altar once and getting saved, they think that's all they need. But what God tells us is we, could, we should continue to seek after God's presence and we should continue to seek after the Spirit and that helps us because in becoming more like Christ, we find that peace and that rest that Hebrews tells us about. So contentment is something we need to strive for, but it's also something we need to avoid making less than we should. 1 Timothy 6 talks about contentment that God offers. In it, Timothy is told, Godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world and we will take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we should be content with that. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people to ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Just think of that last phrase. People who can't be content with what God has given them find themselves making bad choices and making bad decisions and ending up with more trouble and more grief, as Paul says, than they might otherwise have. So we go to our scripture today and we find Jesus talking about what it means to be content. Three things. Just three things. I don't usually do a three-point sermon, do I? Three things. Number one, Jesus is the vine. Okay, that means a lot of things. It means I'm not the vine. It means I'm not the source of my contentment. I'm not the source of my power. I'm not the source of anything in my life. Everything good, Paul says, is a gift from God, from the Father of lights. So Jesus is our source. Jesus is our strength, as we talked about last night, and Jesus is our provision. And God gives us all that we need for life and faith through our faith in Christ. Okay? Let's talk about some places where that happens. Is Jesus enough? Well, in Genesis 22, Abraham and Isaac are going up a mountain. And you've heard the story. It's a scary story. Because Abraham is told to sacrifice Isaac. And they go up the mountain and Isaac is just an obedient child. 
Yeah, I'm not going anywhere else with that. Isaac is an obedient child, and they go up the mountain, and Isaac says, Father, and Abraham says, Yes, my son. And he said, The fire and the wood are here, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. We know the story. Abraham got everything set and then took Isaac and tied him up and put him on the altar and raised his knife before God knew that Abraham's heart was toward him and he did provide a sacrifice. God also provides in other places. In fact, in the Shema, that great statement of faith for the Jewish people and for us, God goes on after telling them, that their Lord is the only Lord, and to follow that Lord, he says, when the Lord your God brings you into the land, he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to give you, a land with large flourishing cities you did not build, houses filled with all sorts of good things you did not provide, wells you did not dig, and vineyards and olive groves you did not plant. In other words, God's provided all these things. Then when you eat and are satisfied, be careful that you do not forget the Lord who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. In other words, God tells them beforehand while they're in the desert that they're going to be provided for, and they're going to have things they didn't earn or get except by God's grace. We can go on through the scriptures. Psalm talks to us all about God's provision and how God takes care of us. Isaiah turns it on its head. As those who have been loved by God, we're supposed to provide for others. And then we have the funny story at the end of the book of Jonah. After Jonah has preached the gospel and the Ninevites have confessed and repented and turned to God, and so God doesn't destroy them, Jonah's upset, so he goes and pouts. And God is nice enough to plant a tree there and it comes up and provides shade for him. And he's still sitting there pouting. So God provides a worm to eat the, to eat the leaves. That's, that's one of the beautiful stories in scripture. God has provided what Jonah needs at every point. Okay. So what we have in the Old Testament is a God who always provides. And in the New Testament, we see that God provides another thing in our lives. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out of it so that you can endure it. Let's make just a quick little exegetical point here. The scripture does not say God will not give you more than you can bear. God often gives us more than we can bear. That's why we need God. The scripture says here God will not tempt you past what you can fight against without God's help. It says that we will be tempted, but with God's help, it won't overcome us. It doesn't say the world's never going to be more than we can handle. Okay? A little freebie there. So number one, Jesus is the vine. Number two, God is the gardener. God is the one who is tending the plant that is our lives and our faith. Now, it says that God does two things. It says that God trims the plants and God cuts the plants. I'm here to tell you, You want to be trimmed, not cut. Because the trimming is nurturing the growth. Oh, here's a plant that's producing grapes. Let's just make it better able to produce grapes and and take care of the things that are in its way. The cutting is removing a branch that's not producing anything. We have a tree out at the front of the property of the church. We have four of them, and three of them are growing, and one of them's just there. God willing, one day somebody's going to feel the call to come cut that down. But in the meantime, it's just taking up space, and there's weeds growing around it, and it's just there. The gardener for our garden of the church would cut that down because it's wasting the energy of the land. In other words, if there's a grapevine, 
And there's one branch that's producing fruit and there's one branch that's just sitting there. God trims the branch that's fruitful. and God cuts off the branch that's not. It's the gospel, don't argue with me. So the goal for both situations is that we would be fruitful. The goal is that we would produce fruit, and there's two kinds of fruit. There's spirit fruit and disciple fruit, okay? The spirit fruit is what we hear about in Galatians 5, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Paul says against such things there is no law. We teach this in Hope in Christ every year because there's not a religion that doesn't want people who act like this. Whether you're a Christian or a Jew or a Muslim or a Hindu or an atheist or an agnostic, you want your kids like this, right? Well, that's the fruit of a spirit. It's not something you can do on your own. You have to have God's help for that to come out in your life. Then there's disciple fruit. And as we read the great readings this morning, we heard that we're supposed to go and make disciples of all nations. That doesn't mean Joe's supposed to go. That doesn't mean the clergy's supposed to go. That doesn't mean the people who think they're supposed to. It means if you're a believer, you're supposed to be making disciples. Now, we'll do it in different ways. We're not Billy Graham, so we're not going to have a stadium full of people. But everybody has folks they can talk to. Everybody has believers they can encourage. Everybody can get in relationships of discipleship where they help each other grow in Christ. We're supposed to be making disciples. So if we look at that, if you're not bearing the fruit of the Spirit, if you don't have love and joy and peace and patience, and if you're not making disciples... Not my job, but it sounds like you're an unfruitful vine. It sounds like you're a branch that's not producing what God's asking you to. And that tells me, well, I want to be trimmed, not cut, right? That's where we find ourselves. So what is it we do? We realize that our job is to remain in Christ. And Jesus says that again and again. He says that that our job is to remain in Christ. And that means I can't do it by myself. I have to get that strength out of Christ. I can't even be a Christian without God's help. Amen? I can't even do what God asked me to without God's help. So I have to remain in Christ. My job is to remain in Christ, so whatever I do, Jesus says, will be fruitless, will be worthless without Christ. I have to remain in Christ. I I might have great ideas, I have to remain in Christ. I might have great concepts, I have to remain in Christ. I might get frustrated and upset, I have to remain in Christ. I have to remain in Christ all the time, every day, every situation. Jesus says that... If I don't remain in Christ, I'm going to be like one of those branches that withers. That is, without the the source of its life, without the provision, it just curls up. And instead of a live branch that's producing fruit, it's wrinkled and gnarled and dried up. And sometimes you cut it off and sometimes it just falls off on its own. And Jesus says those branches might as well be thrown into the fire. So I have to remain in Christ or I might just wither away and die, at least spiritually. I have to remain in Christ and here's the promise. If I remain in Christ, I can ask whatever God's spirit in me has me ask and it'll be done. This produces the faith that moves mountains, that changes the seas that changes lives. If I remain in Christ, then I have God's power to do God's bidding in this world. I don't know. Can you be content with that? Can you be content with God Almighty giving you whatever you ask for? I think I can handle that. Just, I don't know how y'all are doing, but I, I think I could handle that. 
That doesn't mean I'm going to get that Porsche. It doesn't mean my kids are always going to listen to me. It doesn't mean that everything in politics is going to go like I want it to. What it does mean is that God's going to provide everything I need plus a whole lot more. Okay? So, then I glorify God by remaining in Christ and bearing fruit. Right? That's, that's what the whole passage says. Let's go through this step by step. How do I respond to this gospel? How do I respond to this word? Number one, I have to be joined to Christ in salvation. Romans 11, Paul talks about those tree branches that weren't originally in the plant being put in. Well, that's most of us. That's the non-Jewish people in the audience. God has provided a way for us to be part of God's kingdom, to be part of the body of Christ. And we need to accept that. We need to ask for forgiveness, repent from our lives, and let God lead and direct us. And when that happens, we become part of the vine. Then I have to get nourishment from the vine. I think again of the people I knew from the time I was a child who went to the altar or who prayed with their family or who prayed in Sunday school and asked God into their heart. And and the scripture tells us there's rejoicing in heaven when one sinner repents. But we have to get nourishment from Christ. It's not up to the preacher. It's not up to the youth leader or the Sunday school teacher. It's up to you to build that relationship with Christ. You have to read your Bible on your own. You have to pray about your life and then pray for others on your own. You have to have a place where you worship and you have to have a place when you learn about God with other people. And those things are vital. And then you have to serve others. You do it in big ways, like helping with our mission stuff. You do it in smaller ways, like helping with local ministries. And you do it one by one when God says, you need to do this to help this person. Whether it's give them $10 or give them some food or help them to find a house. Those are the important things God asks of us. And you have to get your nourishment from the vine. And then you have to bear fruit. Part of that fruit is I'm asking God to give me love and joy and peace and patience and kindness. Even when I don't feel like getting it, right? I'm asking God to help me to be more like Christ. And then I'm asking God to send people into my life who need to know Jesus. And I'm asking God to help me to pray for and to support and to encourage believers to grow in their faith. I have friends who will never be in this church that I talk to about our faith together. I have people that will never be in this city that I share life and faith with. We make disciples everywhere we go with everything we do. That's what it means to be a Christian. And so that discipleship is a big part of my faith. Spirit fruit and disciple fruit. Okay. It's hard when a few of us are here and most of you are everywhere else. It's hard to to feel what God's saying to you and what God's doing in your life. So we need your help with that. Number one, we need you to tell us that you're on and you're listening to what's going on. We need you to make wonderful comments about our worship team. Didn't they do a great job? We need you to tell us what you thought about the scripture and the message. We need you to let us know what you think might make things better in what we're doing in these times. We need you to like us, whether it's on YouTube or Facebook or Instagram or wherever you are. We need you to share our services with other people that you think they might be encouraging to. And we need you to give us some comments. So here's how you do it. Go to bit.ly, capital E, capital S, RSP, and you can fill out the form. And if you fill out the form, you'll be in a drawing for a prize. Okay? Number two, you share the service link. Uh, Number three, you send a message, an email, a letter, or a card to somebody else. There are people in the church who need your love. So you can call them, you can write them, you can text them, you can message them, but share that love with your church family. And there are other people God will put in your life that you need to keep in touch with. Join our Zoom groups. There's the codes. Can you get those codes, Miss Lori? There's the codes. 
ES Kids 20, ESNYI 20, and ES 20 Adults, 1, 3, and 5. We'd love to see you be part of those conversations with us, okay? All right, we're so glad that you've been with us. Stand with us as we close our service. Let's pray. Oh Lord, the world tries to tear us from you in hundreds of ways. Please help us to hold on to you, remain in you, grow and be nourished by you, and bear fruit that will last in our lives and in disciples for your kingdom. In the name of the Father, Son, and Spirit, we pray. Amen.